Good morning, everyone. Who wants to get better sleep here? Yeah. All right. I was joking about it. I was going to demonstrate it here for a half an hour and show you the real good sleep. But anyway, uh, I've gotten into sleep um, partly because of uh, difficulties with sleep, and also I'm a psychiatrist, so uh, I heard the voices telling me to go into psychiatry, and so <laughs> I had to follow. They also tell me to study sleep, so I'm here to tell you a little bit about sleep. But one of the things I do see day in and day out is lots of people with anxiety, depression, all kinds of stress. And everyone has stress, and it obviously affects our sleep architecture. Um, but also, even if you don't have stress, uh, sleep does deteriorate with age. And there's some tricks to help us all sleep better. It is one of the cornerstones of psychiatry. Matter of fact, in the military, the one way they treat all psychiatric <coughs> syndromes, they have this guy driving a van around on the front lines. And when somebody flips out and starts seeing little men and, or gets very agitated or has psychosomatic problems, they stick them in the back of this van. And they try to get them three nights of good sleep. And uh, if you get good sleep, a lot of things get better. And one of the things that uh, we do in psychiatry is we say eight hours for eight days. If you can get eight hours a night for eight days in a row, a lot of problems going away. So I'm going to try to see if I can get you more than eight days, though. Hopefully uh, 80 years, huh? We'll shoot for that. Um, first of all, I want to kind of go through just sleep. This might be a review for some of you. But I think it's important to know the architecture of sleep because sleep isn't one thing. It's all these different modules in the brain turning on and off during different parts of sleep. And they do different things. And it's good to know those modules because it has to do with the habits that we're going to talk about later. Um, so for the review, people that have reviewed this in the past, I uh, beg your pardon, but we'll do it pretty quick here. OK, so the beginning of the night, a uh, hormone is secreted called serotonin. And it also passes through this little gland, uh, little area of the brain, excuse me, called the pineal gland, uh, the third eye. And basically, <laughs> that is a, an amazing place that takes your surrounding light and it calibrates how much melatonin you need. So if you live in the North Pole, you're going to be sleeping long, long, long winters. And then during the summer, you're going to be up a lot because the sun's up. So the sun, we call a zeitgeber, which is our best timekeeper. But our pineal gland turns serotonin in one enzymatic step to melatonin. And melatonin is our best zeitgeber. It's our best timekeeper. It sets your clock every night. And this little area called the suprachiasmatic nucleus sets your clock. It's our little timekeeper right above your optic chiasm. And um, that sets your whole circadian rhythm. And it's mostly set by light. I got this light right in my eyes right now. So it's messing me up. It's going to mess. <laughs> but one of the interesting things is uh, our whole society changed many years ago with this guy called Edison. And Edison messed us up. And what he did is he changed our suprachiasmatic nucleus. Even though this isn't very many locks of light, it still affects your clock. And in the good old days when we just had fires, we would go to sleep by the fire, uh, we had much better sleep. And now if you look at the map of the US, you'll look at the light pollution. And around areas of light pollution, they actually have a lot more sleep problems and uh, a lot more problems with depression. So you look at the pollution of light, and you look at the people that have sleep problems. And one of the major problems is that thing right there. So we're going to talk about some of the habits to kind of change that. OK, sleep architecture. Stage one, melatonin sets your clock. You get the serotonin, big surge. And you go into the stage one, which is light sleep. And if you've ever sat beside or had a baby that's going into light sleep that you're holding, you, can, you know that they're going to light sleep. They start getting these little myoclonic jerks. You ever feel that? You're going into light sleep, and that sleep is not, it goes in and out of this alpha sleep. You go into stage two sleep, and something very interesting happens. You get these things called K-complexes and sleep spindles. It's just a, these are little markers on the EEG. But something turns off in your brain that's very important. It's called the thalamus. 
And the thalamus is this big railway station for all data to come into your brain. When the thalamus turns off, it's hard to wake you up. Big noises even don't wake people up once the thalamus is turned off. And so once you get past stage two, that thalamus turns off, and it's really hard to wake you up. Up until that time, little noises, somebody getting in bed, creaking, whatever. Things can wake you up in your environment. But once you get, once that thalamus turns off, uh, your brain goes into this really deep sleep. And this sleep right here, now they used to call it three and four. Now we've all basically um, combined it into deep sleep, stage three sleep. And we call this delta wave because when you look at the EEG, you've got these big delta waves. This is one of the most amazing parts of sleep. And this is the type of sleep that you get mostly at what time of the night, do you think? You guys remember this? You get it? What's the opposite of early morning? There you go. You get it at the beginning parts of the night. So we say sleep before 1, you get your deep sleep. You get your what we call restorative sleep. Now, they call this sleep restorative. And uh, for three reasons, and I'm going to go through the three reasons, but they, they did a great study. They always get college students to do these crazy things because you can pay them little and they'll do crazy things. <laughs> so they woke up these college students during stage four, stage three, I mean, delta wave sleep, for a month. And so they didn't get any stage four. What do you think 83% of them had? It's a rheumatological condition. Fibromyalgia. And it is actually our main diathesis now for fibromyalgia. It's delta wave sleep. Because delta wave sleep is re called restorative, restorative sleep. And it is really that restorative. I'm a horrible speller, but. So here's the three reasons why it's restorative. In delta wave sleep, three amazing things happen. One of the things is the rest of your body has lymphatics, except one organ. Which organ do you think does not have any lymphatics? Your brain. So the lymphatics are this great whole system to suck away waste. All these waste products from the rest of your organs in your body sucked away, except for the brain. The brain has no lymphatics. So how do you think the brain is the most active organ in your, well, for most people it is. <laughs> <laughs> Just making a guess, but it's the most active organ <laughs> for most people, right? It's taking up 20% of your glucose, 20% of your ATP, 20% of your blood flow for what? Three pounds. Maybe one to three, depending on who you are, but three pounds. So this organ produces tremendous amounts of waste. So where do you think all that waste goes? Well, all those neurons are packed so tightly that there's no place for lymphatics. So they found this in rat brains, and now they're looking at humans. But basically, during the night only, something amazing happens. Now, Galen, anybody remember Galen? Good old Galen. <laughs> Galen believed the brain was this big pump, right, of fluids, and that you'd pump the fluids out during the night to the rest of your organs. And then during the day, the fluids would come back in. And Galen was a, a crazy man. But turns out he was right uh, in some ways. Because what happens is that in your brain, there's this fluid called cerebral spinal fluid. And the cerebral spinal fluid clears waste. But the problem is it can't get in to the brain. It's so pa tightly packed. And there's no way for the neurons to give way. So what happens at night during stage four is that the blood vessels shrink. And it's an amazing thing. The blood vessels are shrink, and that cerebral spinal fluid, that which is on all these cisterns in your brain, actually goes into the brain. And it cleans your brain. It's like a huge cleaning vacuum. If you guys have, when I was in medical school, we had a, a rule that we would clean up on Friday, right after the test, right? What do you think our kitchen looked like on Friday? It looked like my brain after not getting enough sleep. So basically, um, what happens is that this fluid sucks out all the beta amyloid. You guys remember what beta amyloid does? Well, it builds up. It's, it's, although it's correlative, we don't know that it actually prevents 
dementia, but with Alzheimer's, beta amyloid builds up in your brain. But all kinds of waste products build up in your brain. And the way to clean out your brain is this sleep right here. So if you want to clean your brain, you need sleep before what time at night? Exactly. That's why we're going to go over these different stages. That is the restorative part. It's all of the cerebral spinal fluid flows along the outside of the blood vessels. So the blood vessels shrink, and they make this channel around them where, these, where the cerebral spinal, spinal fluid can get to every cell. It's an amazing system. It's a, it's a way that the brain can, can survive without lymphatics. And then it push, the blood vessels swell up, and the cerebral spinal fluid takes the waste out. And that's how you clean your brain every night. It's called restorative for another reason. There's a hormone that is sold on the black market. It's the most commonly sold hormone on the black market for geriatrics. What do you think that hormone is? Nope. Growth hormone and different derivatives of it. How does growth hormone make you feel? It makes you feel young. So what happens is growth hormone is secreted during only one time of sleep. That is delta wave sleep. So your mom was right, right? What did my mom tell me? Yeah, study, study, study. No, she told me to go to sleep, right? And you'll grow. And sure enough, if you get your delta sleep, so why do these people get pain, fibromyalgia, is we believe this diathesis. So when they don't get stage three or delta wave sleep, they don't get growth hormone. And all day long, what are you guys, bone, what's happening to your guys' bones all day long? Your muscles. You're having billions and billions of micro fractures throughout your body just by doing this. Just by weight bearing, you're causing tremendous amounts of micro fractures throughout your bone. And what about your muscles? Every time you lift that grocery bag out of the car, what happens to your muscles? Rips. What happens to your tendons? What happens to your whole body? Damage. Damage, damage, damage. What repairs the damage every day? Growth hormone. Growth hormone. And this is why we call delta sleep restorative. So you get the sleep before one in the morning you get your delta sleep, and your growth hormone will surge during that delta sleep, and you'll feel better. So people with chronic pain, what's the problem? The pain keeps them from sleeping, which makes the pain worse. You go all the way down until it's just a vicious cycle. So you have to break it, and you have to get them that delta wave, that restorative sleep. Um, OK, and the last one's very interesting. So how many of you guys had your coffee this morning? All right. We're going to talk about that later. <laughs> Just wanted to see who the sinners are. OK. So um, basically, what's in coffee? It's this um, caffeine, which plants use to what? No, they use, plants use it to kill bugs. <laughs> it's a bug killer. Caffeine kills bugs, cola nuts, tea leaves. They're protecting the plant against little munching bugs. But in our brain, it does something really interesting. What does caffeine do? It blocks the receptor to adenosine. So in your body and brain, you basically are using this thing called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And adenosine triphosphate is the way that you carry energy throughout your body. Well, it breaks down to give you energy to this molecule called ADP. So it breaks down. ADP, two ADPs come together and can form another ATP and an AMP. Well, the AMP becomes adenosine. Basically, just remember that the ATP breaks down to adenosine. When your brain builds up enough adenosine, how do you feel? You feel tired because your brain is telling you you need to get back to sleep. So if you think about how your brain works, it's needing tremendous amounts of energy quickly. You think over here and here and here, how fast does it take for the blood flow to get to those places? 
The blood flow doesn't get there fast enough by a long shot. You're thinking way much faster than your blood flow can get to those spots of your brain where you happen to be thinking. So what's giving your brain energy? The blood is always following with glucose. But what gives it immediate energy? Well, it's this cell that wraps around the neuron, which we call myelin, these astrocytes. And they have long chains of this molecule called glycogen. So you know, remember about glycogen, it's always in your liver. Am I pointing the right side? Okay. <laughs> in your liver. So the liver is basically a place where you carry all this glycogen, stored energy, right? Well, in your brain, the only place you carry stored energy is these cells that wrap around the neurons, these myelin cells. And so during the day, while you're using a per particular part of your brain, what happens to those stores of glycogen? They break down, they go to ATP, and your ATP is used up. Glycogen follows a, a nice Krebs cycle, and we get this ATP. Basically, it's used up. So if you, let's say you're playing a, a piano piece, the one-handed piano piece, playing on the right side, which part of your brain is going to be using up a lot of glycogen? Your left motor cortex, right? So if you do this for a few hours and you go to sleep, which part of your brain has the most delta wave? Right where you used it. So your brain is doing what during restorative sleep? It is restoring glycogen. And that's what you need. You need energy. So whatever part of your brain you're using the day before uses up its energy. And the way to restore it is during stage three sleep. So if you want to get energy for your brain, you want to get growth hormones, and you want to clean your brain, what kind of sleep are you going to need? You're going to need delta, and you're going to need to get that sleep before 1 in the morning. How many people stay up past 1? A lot of people. Well, what's happening every day? Constant breakdown. Growth hormone's not replenishing it. You're not cleaning your brain, and you're not replenishing the energy for your brain. OK, that's why it's called restorative. So then 90 minutes into it, on average, 90 minutes into sleep, you get this amazing thing called REM sleep. And it's the most bizarre thing that humans go through. And you actually become a big lizard. It's the only time in your life, in your day cycle, that you become a big, what we call, poikilotherm. And your body changes. So you have what we call this um, uh, pontine geniculate occipital waves, basically. Some serotonin goes down your spinal cord, and it paralyzes your body, so you can't move. So several things happen here. Four things that are amazing happen in REM sleep. So as the night goes on, when do you get most of your REM sleep? In the beginning part of the night or the end part? In the morning time. So as the mem if you wake up in the morning, oftentimes people wake up if they have good sleep in a, in a dream. That's if you're having good sleep. Oftentimes you have a dream in the morning. But as the, as the night goes by, you're getting more and more REM sleep. The beginning part of the night, you get very little of it. But as the night wanes, you get more REM. So REM is an amazing part. REM is what we call super sleep. And in psychiatry, REM is the gold standard. We are always trying to protect REM. It's called super sleep. And it's what keeps your mood good. So there's actually a med named after it. It's so important. You guys ever heard of Remeron? They named it after because we want to protect REM at all costs. REM is so important for several things. So four things happen in REM. During the day, you guys are firing off this old neurons in the brain stem, which have to do with catecholamine, so norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin. And these neurons are their old phylogeny neurons. They break down and they degenerate faster than your cortex. Matter of fact, your cortex does not need sleep. Six layers of your cortex, those pyramidal cells, they don't seem to need sleep. The part of your brain that needs sleep is this old part in the brain stem, the midbrain. These parts of your brain need sleep. And what they do during sleep is they're firing, firing, firing until REM comes along. And then what happens to all of your catecholamines, your serotonin, your norepinephrine, your dopamine? What do you think happens to their firing rate? They stop. They almost stop completely. They stop only during REM. So why do you think they stop during REM? 
That's right, exactly. They are replenishing. It's the only time that they replenish. If they do not get REM, they will not replenish. There's a lot of patients that come into my hospital at uh, Loma Linda BMC, and they've gone on a binge of meth or cocaine. How many days do you think all these guys binge? Five days, exactly. Some, there's a meth user in our audience here, but five days, <laughs> just checking. <laughs> okay, recovered meth user, there we're good. So uh, meth, why are they only binging for five days? That's right, because what are they getting the high from? It's from dopamine. And after five days, how much of their dopamine have they used up? All of it. So on that sixth day when they're slamming, do they get a high? They do not get a high. So they come into my hospital and they crash and they go right into REM. I'll walk into the room and I'll see them in REM. Matter of fact, they're crashing for the next few days so their brain restores their dopamine so they can go out and use again. Sad to say, some of them. But um, basically, if you don't get your REM, you will not replenish your catecholamines. And your catecholamines are what you need to stay sharp, fast, brilliant, mood stays good. We'll talk about all of those. But if you do not replenish those every night. So when I see a lot of patients, they're on antidepressants and they're not working. Well, will an antidepressant work if you don't get any REM? Because all it's doing is blocking reuptake. But if you don't have any neurotransmitter to begin with, it's like just peeing it down the toilet. It does not work. So I see a lot of patients that all I do is I get them REM, and what happens to their mood? It immediately gets better within about eight days. It's amazing. You get your REM, it's one of those uh, incredible things. That's why we call it super sleep. And in psychiatry, we protect it. We are big protectors of REM. OK, so the four things that REM does, and it's quite amazing. If you look at most mammals, all mammals have this thing called um, a hippocampus except two most primitive mammals. You guys remember these uh, egg-laying mammals? That one's called the platypus. Talk about platypus, and one's called the spiny anteater. And they have these huge brains, huge brains. I mean, if we had the brain, we'd have to like, have a huge whale wheelbarrow to carry it around. Comparative to their size, they have huge brains, but they're pretty dumb. So they don't have hippocampi. So we believe, this is just still part of speculation that the hippocampus is a way of hacking information. What it does during the day is it takes what information you have and it processes the short-term memory to store it. The important things that happened the day before, it stores those. And it stores it so efficiently that you don't need a huge brain. The poor platypus needs a huge brain just to store where he swam yesterday, where that little bug that he ate was yesterday. He needs a huge brain because he doesn't have a hippocampus. You guys all have a hippocampus. And during REM, the hippocampus turns on like fire. The whole brain is on fire, but the hippocampus is the most active. And it's being powered by a neurotransmitter called um, acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is what drives REM. And I want you to remember acetylcholine because there's a lot of problems that happen with sleep and acetylcholine. So acetylcholine drives REM. And during REM, what you do is you remember things from the day before. So this combo of deep sleep with REM, we get both a procedural memory, working memory, and declarative memory. They're all stored if you get that nice deep sleep and REM combo. But if you block REM, you'll have problems with procedural memory and some declarative memory. So from the day before, what you need is REM. So a lot of medical students, what do they do right before a big test? They stay up all night and they cram, and they have a stupid brain the next day. Even though they studied it, will they do well in the test? Well, sometimes they do if they're young enough. But in general, it's going to really mess them up. And it's going to take a few days for them to recover. As we age, though, it becomes much worse. So what's happening during REM is that it helps your memory. You want to protect REM. It helps the hippocampus take that short-term memory, put it into the long-term memory. Um, OK, and during REM, the catecholamines turn off. So basically, your core temperature becomes a lizard. So this is the reason why people fall asleep in the snow and die. 
you, if you didn't go into REM, you wouldn't die. You just get a lot of frostbite on your fingers. But the reason why you die in cold while you're sleeping is because of REM. REM turns off the uh, hypothalamus temperature regulation. And so you become a big lizard. And so during sleep, hopefully the person next to you is going in REM at different times so you can keep each other warm. Uh, but in general, you don't want to fall asleep in the snow because you have REM. Um, and there's several meds that we use that block dopamine and block those um, I mean, the hypothalamic dopamine tracks that, and so you'll go out in the sun, you get too hot, go in the cold, and you get too cold. Anyway, REM is this time of sleep where you become this big lizard. But basically, what's happening also is an amazing thing. So my mom is very good about uh, keeping us healthy, but one of the things she used to tell us when we were sick is, you know, she'd give us some garlic tea or something, but she'd always tell us to go to sleep, right? And she was right. Why was my mom right about getting sleep when I had a cold? Well, you can kill a rat in 24 days. You can kill a rat by blocking what part of sleep? Stage one, stage two, stage three? Do they die? They do not die. They only die if you block REM. And they die around 24 days. We can't do these studies on humans, of course, because it seems like it's a little out of the <laughs> purview. Anyway, but. Uh, some people do it on their own, right? So why do these rats die in 24 days? They die of overwhelming infection. Infection. So one of the most amazing things about REM is that it rejuvenates your interferon and your natural killer cells. Your interferon and your natural killer cells are rejuvenated just during REM. And this is a big problem because if you've looked at um, students, uh, medical students, right before boards, right, what do you see all around their lips? Cold sores. If you go in the pediatric ward and you're looking at the peds residents who are up every third night and they're being coughed on by all these little kids and they're like big petri dishes, they're not getting their REM and they're all coughing up green stuff, bronchitis. But in general, one of the best ways to keep yourself healthy the rest of your life is get good REM. REM is one of the best protections for infections. So your natural killer cells and your interferon not only help fight bacteria and viruses, they fight the five killers of mankind. So the five killers of mankind are bacteria, viruses, what, what else do you think kills people? That's bacteria or viral, can be viral. So about 60% of geriatrics have problems, 60 to 70% of, have problems with absorption. Why do you think they have problems with absorption? When you take a scope and you look down their gut, you see a shiny gut. Why is it shiny? It's covered with fungus. As we age, what happens to our fungus levels throughout our body? It increases, and that's one of the problems with geriatrics in dosing, because the med has to get through all that fungus to get absorbed. But as we age, our immune system deteriorates, and one of the main reasons it deteriorates is because of REM. So fungus is one of the killers, virus, bacteria, parasites, and the last one is cancer. How many of you guys have cancer? Well, in fact, all of you guys. How many babies have cancer? 100%. Everyone has cancer all through your life. What is happening to those cancer cells? They are being killed by your immune system. You guys all have fungus. You all have bacteria in your brain. You all have viruses in your brain. What's holding back these five killers all the time? REM, your immune system. You want to really mess up your body? This is what you do. You just stop REM for a while, and you'll be like that rat, that rat that dies. So people that die in concentration of war camps, what are most of them dying of? Pneumonia, infections. You want to kill somebody quick? Just block their REM. And this is what a lot of docs do inadvertently. I want to talk about that. Um, 
Okay, so the other thing is mood. So REM protects your mood because you need those catecholamines to feel stable, to feel like you can handle stress. So when stress comes along, if you're low on serotonin and uh, dopamine and norepinephrine, over time, your neurons actually start firing faster than they should. It's kind of counterintuitive. And that causes the anxiety to rise. So what's the hallmark of a little anxiety and mild depression? What's the main symptom? Oh, is, it, is it sleep problems? Is it uh, enjoying things? Is it coping? Well, sleep is number two, actually. But the most sensitive symptom is irritability. Irritability. So here's the problem. How many irritable people know they're irritable? <laughs> are aware that they're irritable. Everyone around is aware, but the person that is irritable, do they know they're irritable? And even if they do, let's say they do know they're irritable, what do most irritable people think? Well, if you didn't piss me off, I wouldn't be <laughs> irritable. <laughs> so here's the problem, is irritability is the first signal that your stress system is breaking down. And it means you need to protect your REM like crazy. But the problem is most people who are irritable do not know they're irritable. So what I suggest you guys do is talk to people who you love and are close to. Hopefully they'll put it in a diplomatic way. But we all get irritable, and it means that our stress level is high. And that's a time when we need a lot more REM. REM, REM, REM is the super sleep. OK, so memory. OK, the last one is the most amazing thing also, I find, is that in, you look at toddlers, and what are toddlers in most of the time? 80% of their sleep is what stage of sleep? REM. Look at their eyes, you'll see it moving really fast. And so um, the toddlers <coughs> are in REM because there's a other hormone that secretes. So during stage four, what hormone? Growth hormone. During REM, this hormone called BDNF, brain-derived <coughs> neurotropic factor. And we call this the miracle grow for the brain. And that's why toddlers are in it, because it's helping neurons, new neurons grow, new dendritic, new dendrites form, new synapses form. It helps your brain replenish itself. Throughout life, you are replenishing your brain. Only during REM and a few other things, but there's one other thing that causes BDNF to secrete in high levels, and that's high cardio exercise. So if you get good REM, and you get high cardio, you're going to keep your brain sharp. Matter of fact, you're the sharpest during the day at what time of the day? That's right, 8 to 10. When are you going to be the dumbest? <laughs> no, I can't remember. Anyway, no, when are you going to be the dumbest? You're going to be the dumbest. There's this natural decrease in firing of dopamine that happens. With Due to circadian rhythm, it has nothing to do with lunch, but it happens between 1 and 4. 1 and 4, and that's when most doctors make their mistakes, 1 and 4 in the afternoon and 1 and 4 at night. So you don't want to go to your doctor <laughs> in the afternoon. <laughs> They're going to be like, I'll cut that, I'll do this, I don't know what <laughs> They're dictating away. I remember, you know, Mrs. Jones with the prostate cancer, she's got the problem. You get all confused because you are... You're an idiot between one and four, right? Anyway, so as far as BDNF, BDNF is miracle growth for the brain. And if you want to replenish your brain, you're going to need REM. So REM is an amazing part of sleep. It's the type of sleep that you don't want to ever, ever block. Well, this is a problem. It's mediated by this one neurotransmitter, acetylcholine. So let's talk about all the meds out there that block acetylcholine. Um, Anything you get over the counter blocks acetylcholine. They're all antihistamine, anticholinergic combos. So Unisom, Vistaril, Benadryl, all of the combos that people use, those block REM. They get you more sleep of this stage, one and two. But it's not the amount of sleep, it's the quality of sleep. We're all shooting for eight hours. Trust me, that's harder as we get older. But you want good quality. You want to get your restorative sleep, and you want to get your REM sleep. If you take Unisom or Benadryl or Vistaril, they block REM and deep sleep. Another thing blocks deep and REM sleep is 
benzos. So that could be Dalmain, Halcyon, um, Restoril. Uh, the most commonly used sleeper in our hospital, which I've been trying for years to tell the doctors about, is Restoril. And Restoril does horrible things to your brain because it blocks delta and REM. So you get a lot of sleep of what kind of sleep? Cruddy sleep, worthless sleep. And over time, what's Restoril going to do? It's going to make you depressed, stupid, pain, all kinds of things because it's going to block the types of sleep you need, right? You do not want to block the um, REM or the delta wave sleep. Okay, so let me, let me jump right to how do you get good sleep? You guys understand this now. <clears throat> okay, so basically good sleep is more difficult after age 30. Your brain starts to deteriorate very quickly after age 30. And so all of us are gonna have less and less good sleep and more fragmented sleep. But there are some tricks to help your sleep. Now you guys all know about sleep hygiene, but I'll just run through it really quick again. Um, these are things that people understand, but they hardly ever do. I've been doing this for 20 years with patients. They all say they're gonna do it and they hardly ever do it. So if you can do it, you'll be one of those rare few people. Okay, so let's talk about what you need to do with your bedroom. What do you need to do with your bedroom, anybody? Yeah, it's got to be really dark, right? And cool, exactly. Cool and dark, like a cave. <laughs> Not too cold, but a little cool. But what else does need inside the bedroom? Nothing, nothing, nothing. When uh, I used to do, uh, um, I used to do um, oncology for four months when I was an intern, and I remember going to the clinic and watching the patients come in for their chemo. They'd walk right in the clinic, clinic, and they start vomiting. They didn't even have chemo. Just walking through the door made them vomit. Why do you think they were vomiting? It's a strong association with the place. They didn't even have to have the chemo. They were already nauseous right when they walked in. Your bedroom needs to be like that. When you walk in the door, <laughs> I don't want you vomiting, but I want you like, oh, you can barely stay up. You walk in the door, that place is a sleep sanctuary. It needs to be associated solely with sleep and sex. Sleep and sex. We're not taking sex out of it. <laughs> sex does some other things for sleep, too. It reduces stress and oxytocin goes up and all those kinds of things. But basically, no magazines, no TV, no, um, no other little things that you're playing, no uh, pads, iPads, right? No cell phones. Okay, how many of you guys do that? Wow, there's a few. That's great. Okay, so you keep your. Oh, how many how many people do those things? Okay, how many people uh, keep their bedroom a sanctuary like that? Okay, a few people. That's great. Okay, so an hour and a half before bed, what don't you want? No blue light, 490 nanometers. You don't want any of that kind of light. That's the type of light that keeps you your sympathetic tone up. So anything that increases your sympathetic tone, no, no, no. So that means no screens. Matter of fact, the flashing of the screens they found. Now they have screens that are just turned fast enough that they don't affect this, but in general, most of the screens will affect your sympathetic tone, even if you're watching something boring. So you say, oh, watch something boring, but the screen itself will do what to your sympathetic tone? It'll bring it up. And plus the light. Remember what we talked about? Light is a problem. So if you can, do something nice and relaxing an hour, hour and a half as a ritual, as a ritual before bed, you know, maybe. An hour, an hour and a half before bed, exactly. And you don't want to exercise right before bed either, because exercise does what to your sympathetic tone? Brings it up. Warm baths, warm showers, those kinds of things. You want to bring your sympathetic tone down. Did you say don't take a warm bath? No, do. Oh. Don't exercise right before. Don't exercise right before. Don't do your bills right before. <laughs> I know a lot of people, I can't sleep. And they're like, doing my taxes, you know. <laughs> You can't do stuff that's going to bring your sympathetic tone up, right? So if you're, if you're anxious about the test tomorrow, do you study right up to the time you go to sleep? No, you got an hour there of buffer where you're going to de-stress. You're going to do something relaxing. Yes? Yeah, reading, as long as you're not doing it in bed. And yeah, maybe not on a Kindle. Well, I don't know. Uh, I would do it with a nice book. And not, don't read a thriller. 
<laughs> Don't read something that's too stimulating. You're, you're trying to get your sympathetic tone down. That's the main thing. The other thing is you can eat some, not too much, not too little, about an hour before, not any closer. Some, some little bit of food has helped. Yes? Yeah, beautiful. White noise. White noise is another good thing, and it helps a lot of people. Distraction, white noise. Let me start. I have the helicopters over my house. Nice white noise. Hello, Melinda. Uh, but yeah, white noise machines help. But in general, what do you want to do in the morning? You want bright light. Exactly. That's when you get outside and you take your walk. So here's the other thing about sleep hygiene. One of the most important things to do is exercise every day. And the type of exercise that helps the most is high cardio. So a lot of people walk, which is good, and there's lots of benefits from walking. But if you can get your exercise up to the point where it's hard to talk or sing and you're sweating a little bit, that's the type of exercise that actually helps your sleep the most. And when should you do it? In the morning, out in the sun. Because that sunlight sets your clock so you go to bed early. Now, if you're flying to Pittsburgh, when would you want to take that walk? Yeah, really early in the morning, because what are they? Are they going to bed earlier or later than us? Yeah. So flying to, flying to, um, no, what are they doing? They're not going to bed earlier. They're going to bed earlier than us, right? So they're three hours ahead of us. So when you fly to Hawaii, you take a walk in the evening, because you're trying to set your clock the other way, right? You can do that with melatonin. You can take melatonin a few days before you go. But basically, in the morning, exercise, get 20 minutes. That's all you need, 20 minutes of high cardio every day. There's something amazing about every day. And that's what it, uh, people that exercise three times a week, that's great, but it's not the same. There's something magical about the 20 minutes before you shower. If you do that 20 minutes a day, in three months, you'll be sleeping quite a bit better. There is, uh, people exercise really hard, hours, three times a week. It does not do the same thing. And the exercise only has a benefit they've found for about 24 hours. So if you exercise three times a week, there's going to be weeks when you're not getting that benefit, no matter how hard you exercise. So just do 20 minutes, and here's the key. It takes three months to build a habit. In AA, they have 90 meetings, 90 days. They do that because you want to make it unconscious. How many of you guys brush your teeth this morning? All right. But you have to think about it. It's a habit, right? If you can do this one habit, exercise in the morning for 20 minutes, in three months, it's going to take about 8 to 12 weeks, you'll start to sleep much, much better. That's one of those secrets. Now, how many people do that? It's hard. The second month is the hard month to do. Because that's when do most people break their New Year's resolutions? <laughs> By February. <laughs> that's when they're breaking so we always say, get past the second month hump. But once you're past it, once you're into the third month, your life will be better. It not only helps you sleep, it helps all the stress hormones. If you learn anything from this lecture, learn this one thing, 20 minutes high cardio in the morning. Not super high cardio. If, you're don't, if you have joint problems or other things, make sure you talk to your regular doctor. But try to get exercise. If you're walking, walk fast enough so you can't talk for just 20 minutes if you're on a treadmill or that kind of thing. It's worth investing in an elliptical or a treadmill. It is worth it. It'll save your life. It'll make you live longer, fights cancer, all of those things we've been talking about because it's one of the most amazing things you can do. Okay, that's great. I tell people that all the time. How many people do that? Okay, so in the meantime, let's say you do that and you're still not sleeping because there are people that do all of that, and I have patients that do all of that, and they still don't sleep. Well, if they have anxiety problems or depression, you need treatment for that, so we can talk about that another day. But there are some things you can use over the counter if you have to. Remember, this is a last resort. You do not want to stick meds in your mouth if you do not have to. But if you have to, here's the ones that you should use. You should not use anything that's a GABAergic med or an anticholinergic. So what about a nightcap? What about some alcohol? No, that's going to mess up your sleep. Even though they sleep longer, they're getting poor quality sleep. All the benzos, poor quality sleep. All the over-the-counter meds are anticholinergics. 
So if you have to use something, what's the main thing you should go to first? <laughs> yeah, you can use chamomile tea, those kinds of things. Yeah, I haven't found them to work great. But uh, what can you buy at Rite Aid over the counter? Melatonin. There you go, melatonin, bingo. You know, the problem with melatonin and the studies out there, at least that I've seen, are pretty horrible. It's hard because none of the, none of the actual solutions are very um, well calibrated, you know. They're all um, not FDA regulated, you just buy them over the counter. But in general, I find that if, as you get older, you need more. So when you're in your teens, you take you know, one or two. When you get in your 30s and 40s, you take three to five. When you get older, you might need up to 10. No, not in the morning, at least not in the morning. So what it does is it sets your clock. So when you take melatonin, when do you need to take it? Same time every single night. If you mess up with the time, it'll mess up your sleep. When you say every single night? Or every, or? every single night if you need it. Yes, because remember, it's kind of resetting your clock. That's what melatonin is for, it's to reset your clock. So I, I usually tell people to take around nine, depends on their sleep cycle, but remember we're trying to shoot for some restorative sleep, so we want to get to bed 10, maybe nine, 9.30. Depends when you get to bed, about a half an hour before you go to bed. Again, it depends on your age. It depends on your age. Yeah, you know, once you get into your uh, 50s or 40s, you know, I would say get up to around three to five. Once you get into your 60s, 70s, you can get up to seven, sometimes 10, if you need to. And I want you guys to go to bed at, at 8.30 in the evening, no. <laughs> I want you to get good eight hours, right? Now, as you age, what happens to your circadian clock? It goes counterclockwise. So when I go to the gym in the morning, who do I see in the gym? I see all the seniors there. Do I see any young people there? No, because they're getting up at like 10, right? So grandma and people in their 60s or 70s, they're going to bed earlier and they wake up earlier. That's part of the cycle. Teenagers sleep way in. But in general, what you're shooting for is eight, yes. You know, I, I don't know enough about that, just to be honest. Um, the, other, the other thing, other melatonin, is valerian root. And now valerian root smells like horrible sweaty sauce. So you have to whirl that in the back of your throat and take it with some, something good. But if you combine the melatonin with valerian root, what? Yeah, chamomile tea. Of course, not regular tea, but chamomile tea or herbal teas, definitely. What's that? Milligrams, yeah. But basically, I, I'm, just, I'm just guessing here because they're all different. And I wish I, I wish I had a, uh, a good North Star on that. But I would say get it to the point where you're using it every night for at least a few weeks and see if it's getting you that nice uh, set time to go to bed. So, so melatonin, valerian root, let's say that's not working. You're exercising. What's the, what's the um, next thing that you can add to it? Yeah. Well, in the meantime, you need to make sure you don't have what condition for sleep? Sleep apnea. It is the major problem in America. As a matter of fact, one-fourth of men have it. And about 15% of women have it. But almost all of them don't know they have it. And they'll have it for many, many years without it being caught. But it is the main problem. About 40% of my patients have sleep apnea. And I'm sending people to sleep studies all the time for sleep apnea. So if somebody says you snore loud like a banshee, chainsaw, or you wake up with a headache, got high blood pressure, sleepy during the day, you should get a sleep study immediately. But sleep apnea is something. So if you're not sleeping it by this time, you should start thinking about these things. Matter of fact, you should think about that anytime. But the next thing to add is trazodone. Trazodone. It's not good in high doses, but it's the next thing. We're now at the, it's prescription. But it preserves your REM, and it preserves your deep sleep. And it's one of the only sleepers. Now, as you get higher, it causes a hangover in the morning. And so what I recommend people do is take the melatonin with valerian root, take 50, break it in a quarter. It doesn't come in that dose. But just take the 50, break it in a quarter, 
take the corridor with the melatonin and the valerian root. And it'll protect your REM. Um, and if you need more, you can titrate it. But ask your daughter, uh, ask your daughter. If your daughter's a doctor, ask her. <laughs> to re <laughs> not to give you this, but to refer you to a good doc um, to get some trazodone. That's, take it with the melatonin always, and take it with valerian, yes. In, in general, what they say is if you can go right back to bed without turning on the lights, you're the best. The problem is that people fall over at night, and you know, if you have problems with navigating, definitely. But if, once you turn on the lights, it's, it messes your sleep up. So if you can go to the bathroom in the dark and go right back to bed. If you do wake up at night, try to stay in bed. You don't need to get up. Yeah, go, try, to, try, to, try to go back to sleep as fast as possible, yes. Versus what? Okay, so yeah, let me, let me just get into the next, so, so this is the, the algorithm. First melatonin with valerian root, then add a little trazodone. If that's still not working, we sometimes add Ambien, although it's a horrible sleeper, and for women especially. But we sometimes add Sonata, Lunesta, Ambien, they're all in the same family, and I, I do that as a last resort. But that's again, because I'm looking at everything else. Lots of hormonal problems cause it, thyroid problems cause problems, so we're looking at other things. I have to end there, sorry guys. Uh, I'll take your questions afterwards, thank you.